the Community Development Committee. Um, we will open up the floor for public comments on anything that's not on the agenda. If anyone has any comments from the public, now is your time to come up. Seeing none, we'll move on to public presentations that are informational only. First up, we have the Mission Summer Camp and Mission Family Aquatic Center Season Reviews with Jenny Smith and Louise Benavides. Thank you, council, committee members, mayor, glad to be here. So here to talk about the 2019 summer camp that we had at the Festival Junior Community Center. I'm Jenny Smith, I'm the recreation supervisor over at the community center, myself and Nick Shepard, the program coordinator at the community center. We're in charge of summer camp and we had an awesome year. Um, so you guys have the slides in front of you. If you want to follow along, I'm going to add some additional things that are not on the slide, but I'll keep it nice and tight. So we did continue to maintain our license with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment this year. Camp ran from nine weeks, and we employed 35 to 38 seasonal full-time staff members. This year, we had 1,450 campers. Of those, 1,450, 232 were unique campers. And I bring that number up because I think it's really cool. We have a lot of returning campers from week to week to week. This allows us to really create a bond with these campers, um, get to know them and their quirks, and it ends up kind of building a community and a bit of a family uh, with our campers. And so that's why I put those two numbers on there. Of the 232 unique participants that we do have, about 24% of them are Mission residents or their camper has a parent that works in the city of Mission. Fees stayed the same um, this year from last year, and that's because we rose prices a couple of years in a row, and we feel like right now we are at a competitive edge. We are comparable to other locations that offer camps in our area, and so our fees have stayed the same. We love our camp because it really gives kids an opportunity to keep in a structured environment in the summertime when they're not in school. It's a really awesome time for them to make new friends, learn new skills. We offer a lot of add-on activities, such as swimming, tennis, basketball, and then we also even have some that go a step further. They get some of the STEM aspects of learning with our Lego camps, which has a lot to do with engineering. It also has some computer programming when they're doing video game design. So we're able to offer those skill sets to them and, and have them learn some new things in the summer. One thing that I really like about what we do for summer camp, and these kids remember how much fun they had with us. They made the friends, they made those memories, and what I think it does for us is it turns them into Parks and Rec kids. They'll remember this as they get older and they're going to think back, man, I had a lot of fun at Parks and Rec, and hopefully that's going to encourage them to continue to participate in Park and Recreation programs, which is a definite boon to our uh, agencies. A few changes that we did make this year that are not on the slide, so I'm just going to kind of tell you a few things that we thought were important to note. Um, one of the things we did was in regards to safety. We did change our pickup policy. We wanted parents to feel safe and secure when they came to pick their children up or when they left their children with us. This year, we implemented pickup cards. Each family received four laminated pickup cards, and when parents arrived or other guardians or other pickup opportunities came to pick them up, they had to have that card with them. If they did not have that card, we required them to show their ID to approve, prove that they were on the approved pickup list. We got really positive feedback from that. Parents really enjoyed that. It made them feel good that we were taking that extra step. So it was a really good policy to implement. A second policy that we implemented this year is our group structure. In years past, we've had four groups, um, typically with our younger camp, that led you to have 30 to 35 kids in a group. A little chaotic at 30 to 35 kids in a group. So we trimmed that down a little bit, and we did six groups. We called them animal names, and it got us down to about 20 campers in a group, which was just, like I said, a lot more manageable. Also, the animal names were super fun. Everybody loved being a bear or a panther or a tiger, so that worked really, really well for us. The next slide I'm going to dive into is kind of the revenue and expenses. And so, again, we had a good year this year. Um, we stayed consistent. Our cost recovery did go up this year from um, the previous two years. You will note that I do have some asterisks there, and this is specifically relevant to the supplies expense for 2019. You may see that it's up about $3,000 from years past, and that is directly correlated to the fact that Kansas Department of Health and Environment implemented a new policy this year, effective in 2019. All camp staff must be fingerprinted, and those fingerprints must be submitted to the FBI. 
was a new process for us this year. There's a fee associated to that. That's where those, that extra money came from. I want to give a big shout out to the Mission Police Department for our help with that with this year. Robert Myers was a big help to us. It was a hard, muddled process for us to get through. And without their help and his help, we, we would have struggled. So a big thank you to that. Any questions about expenses or revenue, please feel free to follow up with us um, anytime you have any questions about that. I won't get too in the weeds on that. So I'm going to kind of move on to what we're kind of planning for 2020. And so keeping in the theme of how our changes were so well received this year, we want to keep that ball rolling. So we're very excited for 2020 to rebrand our camp. So rather than having two camps under the same umbrella, which is currently how we function with an MSC and a TNT, we are going to combine camps. We are going to have one mission summer camp. And the reasoning behind that is kind of twofold. One, we found that this summer staff tended to have some underlying currents of dissension among each other. A lot of comments that I heard maybe was like, our camp's better than that. Our camp's better than your camp. And while it wasn't overt and it wasn't out in the open, I could tell that there was just a little bit of competition that wasn't a healthy competition. And so to better utilize the strengths and the weaknesses of our staff, we're combining camps. Our camp will now run from kindergarten age up to 12 years old. We will add new groups. Again, our staff will come together. We will have those strengths and weaknesses of our staff to combat each other. I think it's going to provide a more structured environment for our camp and it's gonna solve some of those competition issues that we've had. Now you may say, currently we run our camps and they go up to 13 years old, so what about the 13 year olds? So an additional thing that we wanna um, include for 2020 is what we're calling our counselor and training program. Our counselor and training program is going to be for those 13 year olds that parents are still looking for care for. There are some requirements that are gonna be held to the CIT. They have to be campers that have been with us in the past. We are really going to promote this role as a good opportunity for them to learn job skills, responsibility for your 13 year old. They will work directly with a counselor in their group. They will help lead games, activities. They will serve as a role model to the younger campers. Participate, have fun, let's have a good time. They will go with us to swim, they will go with us on field trips. Again, promoting those life skills that they're going to need and show parents that these are some job preparation skills that their campers um, can get through. One awesome thing for us about it is I think it's going to be a great feeder program. We'll get them in when they're young, show them how cool it is to be a counselor. That's going to lead us down the road to have those counselors want to come back and work for us when they're able to and they're of age. So we're very excited about the 2020 changes. Again, every year that we've been here and Nick and I have worked together, our camp has gotten better and better, and we just can't wait to see what 2020 brings next year. So that's really all I have for our... Presentation, so I'll open up to you guys if you guys have any questions. Yeah? Yeah, I have a question about the scholarship fund. Mm -hmm. I noticed that uh, revenue-wise it was lower than it was in the previous years, and I was just seeing it has, you know, what changed, and also do we have availability for funds for scholarships? Right. Great question, yes. There was very low drop this year. Where most of our scholarship fund is driven from is during what we offer at the community center on our free family fund nights. Any concession items that are sold at those events, that money is what goes into the scholarship fund. We didn't have a great turnout for our concession items last year. I'm not sure why that was. I don't know that. I think, honestly, what it was is that we didn't promote what those concession monies was going for. I think we need to get better about letting parents know, hey, this helps fund a camper to come to camp with us. So I think that can kind of sh shift a little bit. Another plan that I have for 2020 to bolster those numbers up is we want to have a special event in conjunction with a, another special event, and I want to do a duck race. And every duck that is purchased is going to go to the scholarship fund. Um, we'll sell a thousand ducks, is what I'm hoping for, at three dollars a piece, or they can get a price fake if they buy three ducks. So I'm hoping to bolster that fund up for 2020, but 2019 was a low year. So we did subsidize a lot of our camp scholarship um, opportunities this summer. So we had eight scholarship campers this summer, and we did help subsidize that. Okay. 
And so was the need greater than the eight, or was eight all that applied? Eight was all that applied. Okay. Pretty much everybody that applies, we, we get them in. Now, we did have one person apply that did not meet the um, requirements that we set. We go off of federal poverty levels and then also added Johnson County poverty levels. We find those numbers, and if they fall within that line, they're approved. If they do not, they are not approved. So they submit all those tax documents and an application each year. So, yes. <clears throat> All right, no more questions. Let me know, follow up. My email address, jsmith at Mission KS. I'd love to answer any questions you may have that come to you later tonight when you're laying in bed. Have a great night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right, next up we have the Mission Market Season Review with an app. forgot. They're combined. The Mission Family Aquatic Center. Ah, uh, <laughs> forgotten already. <laughs> I will take as long as I need. <laughs> I'm, kidding. I'm kidding. Thank you guys for having me. I'm really glad to be here. It seemed like yesterday was I was here talking to you about the 2018 statistics, and I was really excited about those. Even more excited about what we have to show you tonight. You do have a uh, presentation with you as well, so please feel free to, to let me know if you have any questions as we go through. Uh, some of our highlights here, I'm not going to go through all these pictures, but the picture in the middle is when we opened up, for Sylvester being closed, we opened up at 5 o'clock in the morning. That's probably one of the prettiest things I've ever seen. <laughs> right when you turn those lights on, the overhead lights aren't on yet. We have people waiting outside the uh, gate to come in, and that's the first thing that they see. So I wanted to highlight that because we had a lot more people this year that utilized the pool than last year when the Sylvester uh, Powell Junior Community Center was closed. So very happy about that. Highlights this year, almost identical to 2018, had 101 days. Uh, September 2nd, we closed our doors. We left the splash pad on. The biggest difference that you're going to see in 2019 to 2018 was the closures due to weather. So we had a lot more wet days this year. So we had just under 10 days, 9 I believe, uh, where we actually had to close the facility at some point. I do not like to close the facility all day. I like to go based on um, increments. So this includes early closings. If we had storms come in around 5 or 6 o'clock and they were going to be um, storming until 8 o'clock at night, Late openings, if we had storms running through, but we had to open maybe at 1 or 2. And then there was just a couple days where we had to um, have an actual all-day closing. And unfortunately, those all-day closings were around our busiest times. And that was Memorial Day, 4th of July, and then Labor Day weekend. So rain got us on our busy days, but it, it, it's okay. People still had a great time, and we still had a very successful season. We had no rate membership fee increase, and we again hosted the 2019 championship for the Mission Marlins swim team, which we won um, both of those days. So, Mission Marlins swim team is an amazing team, and we really enjoy working with them. So, our revenues here uh, I'm not going to go through every single column, but I like to highlight the differences in between. So for 2018 and 19, we had a 2,227 drop in our memberships. Daily passes, 45,000 to just over 46,000, a $203 increase. Can I, can I ask a question? Yes, sir. Marion Pool was down, right? So I thought we were expecting an increase in memberships. So that is true. Yes, we are. Expect, we were expecting an increase. I don't necessarily think we were expecting an increase in the memberships. Uh, because Merriam still offered to allow their residents to get the Super Pool Pass anyway. They gave it to them for free. But as we go through the slides, you'll see that we had an influx in non-resident um, single-day passes. Right. Concession stand. We went uh, and increased by $2,117. I would like to highlight this. I know last year I stood before you very excited about the revenue that we had increased. But I told you one of my goals was I wanted to decrease the expenses. And to this date, I can tell you that from the what I have in my papers, we were $6,100 under in expenses. So we were a lot smarter with what we were spending. Um, we made 
very, very smart choices on what we were um, buying and what we were buying in bulk, opposed to buying some things that we could get at smaller um, increments instead of buying them in bulk because of the shelf life. So, very happy about that. Um, that's one thing I'm really excited to talk to you guys about. <laughs> classes, we went down uh, $99. We did have our swim lesson classes for our camp inside this year, so that was a difference. Uh, one thing I would like to do if we're going to continue to do that is that get that spot some time for some uh, daycares to come in and utilize that facility because those are two days that we could use utilize that for daycares as well. Rentals. We had an increase of $3,542. The biggest thing we did was we bought a, an A-frame from uh, uh, SignPro, put it out in our front uh, gate office, and we also just handed out pamphlets. And we had a lot of two, uh, one-star and two-star uh, parties this year. So that was our bread and butter when it came to our rentals. Uh, very cheap marketing, and as you can tell, it definitely helped. And I would like to continue to build that, because I still feel that we have a lot more room to grow. Super pool passes, we were down $887, which is a 12% uh, decrease. And I'm going to go a little bit more into our super pool passes here in a minute. But as you can see with our revenue, we actually went up a little under $3,000. It was a 2% increase from last year. All right, the expenses. 2018, we had a personnel expense of $138,079. This year, we had a personnel expense of $136,932. What is very vital, vital about this information is last year, we started the season understaffed. We had a lot of staff that were working a lot more hours. Uh, we were not, I was actually on stand. So this year, when we opened the doors, we were at full staff. There were two days out of the entire summer where we were, did not have that full staff, and I was on stand, and that was for, at most, two to three hours. So we have a lot of returning lifeguards. We're becoming a lot more effective with our lifeguards. Our lifeguards are a lot more, they're highly more trained because they have done this for a year. Um, and to me, that makes me say that we have a very good culture when it comes to what we are providing our employees. They want to come back. They're inviting their friends. And this is a place that they want to work. So even though we're, we were down, we were down with having a full-time staff. More personnel. Contractuals went down by $5,377. Our commodities did increase by 6640 A few things that I would like to... Um, shed some light on. There were a few things that we had to purchase. We had a squirrel in the off season decide to make our water heater its home. Chewed up all the wiring in our water heater. Um, he scared me half to death when I opened the door and he pops out. Uh, and so we made sure that we purchased a new water heater. That was about $4,000. And then as well as our um, ADA chairs to make sure that we have anyone with an ADA requirement to be able to get into our, our competition pool. So those two big purchases we had as well. And this also goes with, I was well in the means of my um, allotment when it comes to uh, commodities because there was a $3,700 increase in those funds because of the trends we were seeing from 2017 and so on. So totals from 2,333 to 200. 200,035, we're still well in that cost recovery of 58.66%. I was aiming for 60%. It's, I'm still aiming for that spot, so we're going to continue to get better. We're doing a lot better. We're making a lot better decisions, but I still want, and I still believe we can do better. In fact, memberships and daily passes. So our resident passes did go down a little bit, 108 um, residents shallow, short. I cannot speak today, I don't know what's going on. Our non-residents, however, went from 1758 to 3012. So we had a difference of over 1200 
non-residents. And this does not include super pool pass. So this is anyone that's a non-resident that is buying uh, the, the membership, but doesn't necessarily mean this is a super pool pass holder. Our total is 6,613 for 2018 to 7,759 for 2019. So we went up 15%. Our daily paid visits, 3,518 to 3,288. Non-resident, 2,424 to 2,720. So we did see a flux in non-residents coming in and doing their daily paid visits. And then we also we increased our total of our daily passes by 6,000. Uh, I'm sorry, by 66 people. I spoke at the Super Pool Pass Committee yesterday, and I found out that across the board they were down 7% in, in sales. So everyone felt a, a hit. Uh, I asked them, why do you think that is? They said the weather. I don't really buy it because people are purchasing these passes at the beginning of the season. There's no really way to tell. So that's one thing I'm wanting to do. Uh, Nancy helped me compile a list of our 2018 or 2019 Super Pool Pass purchasers. And one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask those people that did not renew. What was it about this year that caused you to not renew? And so hopefully we can get some answers with that. Uh, talking about really hitting the market when it comes to the Super Pool Passes next year, uh, especially with Merriam still being, um, not being built. So our total visits went down by 10 visits here. As you can see, we had a huge chunk of Merriam Super Pool Pass users. Went from 1,016 to 1,708. If you do notice, I did have the 2017 column. I just wanted you to really look at the trend, is that we are still, regardless <coughs> if it was a wet summer, um, we were still having a lot of people come and visit our facility. And that's, that's really good. Our programs, day care visits were from 280 to 422. We had an extra daycare come in this year. Um, well, they weren't an extra daycare. They brought in more kids this year. So we had a daycare that comes in on Monday. We also have a daycare that comes in on Friday. And then we had a daycare that came in during the day uh, on Wednesdays. Kitty pool playtime, we did see a hit from 1345 to 1246. Tan float, 359 to 111. Our dive-in movie, we had 103 people to 88. What I would like to um, point out on this is our dive-in movie, that 103 people was for two dive-in movies in 2018. Unfortunately, our dive-in movie, uh, our second dive-in movie this year was rained out. So that 88 was for one, uh, one movie. So next year, um, when we uh, have those two dive-in movies again, Hoping to get those 100 people in per per, um, per night. So I'm pretty excited for that. We've, we've had a lot of good compliments when it comes to the dive in movie. We love it. Yeah. <laughs> Pool party for pooches 26 pooches in 2018 <laughs> to 49, and they came in all shapes and sizes. On the very first uh, slide, one came on the side car of a motor motorcycle. Uh, with his goggles on, we had a chihuahua with a uh, with a vest on. It was it was fun. It was fun, and those dogs do not care. They'll go anywhere they want to. They'll do their business anywhere. So my mission for this year was to create a real good culture for our employees. And what I did is I wanted to implement, kind of think of it as a family business. You care about the people that you're working with. It's more than just friends, it's a bond, and when you work with people like that, you tend to go above and beyond for those people. You tend to work harder for those people. And that's what I really wanted to introduce into our staff this year. That's what I really wanted to encourage and have them run with that. A few things we did is had the uh, staff go out. We had Buffalo Wild Wings one night. 
As you can see on those outer pictures, we had some kids wanted to do the blazing challenge. In the middle, we had there was uh, one of our front desk girls. Their church was hosting a, um, a fundraiser, and so a lot of us went to support that. So we're starting to build this, and this is another um, way of showing you this commitment that our kids are starting to really install and this pride they're getting working with City of Mission. This was their break room um, slash storage closet at Sylvester Powell. Because I've had 70 employees in the summer, and I currently have about 30 right now. So about half of my staff are still here. And what they did to this room, working together to create something that they could put some pride in, you see the hand marks on the front. Um, those were the people that actually uh, worked on that. One of our own staff members is the one that drew the Mission Aquatics on there. And they love it. They take better care of it. It's more, it's clean. They like to, to then they say they're not, they don't feel like they're in a storage closet anymore. They feel like they're in a room that's fit for them. A few pictures that I posted on here. The far right, we also do a um, like a thank you at the end of summer dinner. And the three that are right there, that is Gabriel, Lydia, and D'Angelo. They actually cooked the food that we that we served. We had um, uh, Mexican tacos, Mexican rice, beans. Uh, we did taco salads. They served all the lifeguards, all the front desk staff, all the concessions. That was another thing is we did not want to have those lifeguards, front desk, concessions. We were all MPEC staff. And so we served those kids. These are two of our Mission Marlins. Uh, they had a I Woke Up This Way day for their swim meet championships. They actually have uh, my his and hers mugs that I got for myself and then the kid I have my arm around, James, he calls me dad. He bought me that shirt that night and brought that for me. He, I'm a father figure to him as well as some of these other kids. Um, and it really makes me feel good that they care that much about me and that they know that I care that much about them. So he's off as a collegiate swimmer now. And in the middle, just a few times that the kids got to get together before work and... Um, you know, enjoy what they're doing and have pride in the work that they're doing because they could be in retail, they could be in fast food, but they're choosing to be out in the sun protecting people while they make good memories. And it's starting to click with them now. Any questions for you guys? I know I ramble, I apologize. What kind of marketing are we doing to get the word out? You said you wanted to drag us in different marketing for the passes for next year. Yes, I would like to do more on social media. I would like to um, utilize our free family fun nights, our big events where we have all these people coming in, holiday lights, and have a booth for those different events. That way people know. Um, I would like to also consider maybe selling our passes earlier, doing like a Christmas, um, Cyber Monday, or something like that, and utilize people are going to be buying stuff for their loved ones. Why don't we put our passes out there and get that in their mind now? Even if they don't purchase it now, it's still in their brain for spring. So, that's your question. Okay. Yes. So, I know that I had a few times We have. We, uh, we wanted to create a lifeguard of the week guard to. Problem was, when we created it, the paint was coming off. Um, we couldn't allow that lifeguard to be on stand with it, and that would be a safety issue. Um, so, and unfortunately, by that time, it got way too close to summer that we had to kind of table it. But that is something that we're still looking for. And if you guys have any type of opinions, thoughts, you know, I would love to hear them because that is something I always would like to do. I'm 
want to implement like a point system where they can earn things uh, so they can work towards stuff. Uh, but you know, it's just I have all these ideas. <laughs> got to got to channel them in a little bit. So yeah, most definitely. I know that a few years ago we, we visited the um, how the wages for our uh, life cards, and yes. I was wondering if that's still effective. It looks like we're we're still retaining our life cards year over year. Yes. And then when you anticipate us needing to revisit that just because uh, Right. I honestly, even if it's not on the table to make a change, I feel like that needs to be visited every year and keep an idea of what everyone else is, is paying. Um, we did have a good flux in some of the Merriam lifeguards, but we lost a lot to Overland Park because they increased their, their wage substantially. Um, so we're, we're sitting in the middle, which is, is, which is good. Um, and I believe that culture that we have started to create to me, is going to be more than an extra 25 cents, or you know. Um, but yes, I want to stay competitive. I want to have the best kids out there um, for our patrons. Not sure 100% how that, you know, how to do that yet. You've also done a great job of getting the um, opportunity for raises for the part-time staff, whether that's and that's something that kind of fallen off um, for several years, and so they have an evaluation system, and there's that opportunity, so there's that incentive for kids to come back and earn that additional, um, or have that increase in their salaries. Yeah. Exactly. And referral bonuses, we offer that as well. I thought it was great seeing the same life guards, and then I even saw siblings, and I just wanted to make sure that we maintained that, because yeah. those, those kids are awesome, and they can do jobs. Yeah, most definitely. We have... I even just hired a couple more siblings now. So, too. So, you're right. I mean, it, it's it's good, and it speaks volumes of their experience here. Thank you guys so much for your time. Have a great evening. Stay dry. All right. Thank you both for those presentations. We appreciate all that you do. Um, okay, now it's time for the Mission Market season interview with Emily Randall. Thank you. So I'm um, here to talk more formally. I've shared a little bit of feedback from 2019, but we ended our season at the end of August and just wanted to recap a few of our numbers. Um, I would say on the whole, what we planned in this very room a year ago um, worked and um, feel really just very positive about the comments we got back on the survey. I'll go into that. Um, but I think our format worked for our staff, worked for our vendors, worked for our guests. I think in general we just feel really good about where we hit, um, still room for improvement always, but just seems to me like we found kind of a niche and we can do a lot with this space we now occupy. So uh, the big number is really that average daily attendance. And so I have to caveat all of my enthusiasm tonight to say we had a great weather year. <laughs> so I don't want to take all the credit. Um, comparatively to the dismal 2018 situation we had, um, we were lucky. And it would rain on Wednesday, it would rain on Friday, but Thursday would be great. Um, so I don't know what next year holds, but I will you know, give that caveat to all that I say here. But that average daily attendance number uh, stayed true for us throughout, which was thrilling. So um, towards the end, I, you know, the first year you see the spike, the first market week we had 1,200 people. Um, and this again is just the best we do is a snapshot head count every half hour and then add them up and average that. And so it's not scientific by any means, but um, uh, that big strong dip is that July 4th market day that we were closed. Um, but otherwise that pretty yellow line just hovers right above all of the others. So. Um, just felt really good about that. Towards the end of the season, we were averaging just right kind of at the 500s. Um, even when there weren't special events, even you know, just really kind of on the whole, that was our crowd, which we felt really great about. Um, so vendors also um, up a bit. I think there's still really strong room for growth here. I would have felt more comfortable just in terms of insurance against people getting sick, having car trouble, deciding they didn't want to risk the thunderstorm threat. Um, to just build our, our average by a few more and have a few more people on the lineup. My dream is to have the default be that all of those stalls on the front line are full and that we have a capacity issue and we just have never really hit that 
Um, we got close several times this year. Um, one noted um, exception to that was our Dog Days of Summer event where we had a whole host of animal themed vendors that were kind of on the side um, set up there. Um, but we um, have heard back from our vendors on a survey. We had 15 of our vendors respond and just the, the weighted averages about the how likely would you be to recommend the market uh, the weighted average was 9.13 um, to extremely high, you know, ranking a 10 out of, of that for recommending it to another vendor. And 9.4% of a weighted average say that they are extremely likely to return next year. Um, and the comments we got back were just really supportive. And so I feel like we have a good crew that believed in us through the end and will... Um, will give us referrals even in addition to what they did. Another thing we did in regards to the vendors this year, um, we, we really tried to not let up in terms of recruitment and we tried to do some very targeted uh, recruiting once we hit July to try to finish strong. So we had a few vendors that we really wanted to get, such as like Mesner Bee Farm, that have really high visibility and a very classy operation. And we wanted them to come and we've talked to them every year and we finally, you know, figured out a way to get them there the very last day. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it was just a scheduling thing, but we'll just keep those relationships. They had a positive experience. I hope they come back. And I think the model of inviting some of the busier vendors um, to come just for, just to set a few dates with us throughout the season so that we can promote them and get some mileage out of that sort of special appearance by some of our vendors. So you don't have to commit to us for the whole season if you're not comfortable with doing that, but could you give us the first week of each month or something along those lines to so just keep the variety and keep the flow. There's a balance in the scheduling, I think, between having reliable, consistent vendors so everybody who wants to buy what they bought last week will feel confident in finding it the next week. And then also just variety, so you never know what's going to be down there, so you need to come back every week. So what we hope is everybody wants to come back no matter what, and we'll try to give them a good time, but um, there is that kind of push and pull. We didn't have certain things this year that we've had in the past. The baked goods, I don't know what happened to them, but we didn't really have, you know, last year all we had was baked goods. Um, and then some sort of, you know, hormone-free, antibiotic-free meats, you know, the pasture-raised meats are a really big draw for market folks, and something that will pull you back each week, because whatever you bought and so we'd, um, we'll, we'll still do some more targeting in that for next year. So here a, a little bit if more. I could, if I could ask a oh, question. Sure. Um, the previous slide you show that the season, you shortened the season. So what was the impact of shortening the season? Yeah, that was probably, um, I think for us running the market, it felt really strong and we didn't run out of steam and we kept the momentum going and it didn't feel like a reach for us in terms of hosting a program to its fullest for the time. I think a lot of people feel like it's too short, but I think the scarcity factor plays to our advantage in a way. Um, there are a lot of people that are rightly pointing out that harvest go, you know, there are great vegetables through September, um, that the weather obviously is more cooperative later in the year. Um, we just, we were playing in that summer space that and I mean aligning our season with the mission outdoor pool season where really people go back to school and they're going back at the beginning of August um, basically you know 10 days into August they're back in school and we just we could feel the attention drift where we were fighting uphill which is kind of why we hoped to have some of that insurance with the new vendors so it's a decision point for sure if there's strong feeling among the council we felt really good about the tighter time frame um, we were excited and enthusiastic about it up until the very end um, and I think leaving them wanting more isn't the worst thing in the world. Um, but it's a question, and I, I mean, I know we, we judge that we are balancing great weather and good vegetables against millions of other obligations, um, soccer and homework and all of the things. So it's a it's a trick. But let's see. So public survey. Um, Mission residents, so last year I think it was 69% of our respondents were mission residents. It wasn't a particular goal that we would um, have that number be lower. Um, obviously we would just like more of mission residents to attend the market, but I do feel good about the fact that our reach was getting out a bit. And you could say if we were truly targeting those workplaces, um, lots of those people theoretically could maybe live in other cities and if they were coming after work, um, maybe that plays to our advantage or who knows? Who knows what to expect, expect there? Um, still, even with our kind of happy hour vibe, people are marking down, making purchases um, of things to take away. Our 
are still is still the leading reason why people say they're coming, um, even if they maybe buy something but they linger along a little bit um, potentially. Other obligations still far and away the reason cited for people not attending more often, uh, which is just the way of the world I think this these days. So in the comments, I think still definitely there are some holdouts for Saturday market. I have no remorse about this <laughs> whatsoever, <laughs> but um, that's still out there. And so, and I understand that, and I think that's true of any of the programs we offer where it would work better for me this day or that day, but I think on the whole, we were happy to see the faces we saw and that it works for some, and as the excitement builds or word of mouth spreads, people will shift their schedules a bit and potentially try to join us for a few Thursdays. So, um, I, I, I just felt like it works very well for us, and I um, have no wish to go back and compete against the larger Saturday markets, but there are some of those sentiments, just in full disclosure. Um, higher confidence in finding what you need, this was really important for me this year, um, where we offered good variety. We had a really solid um, produce anchor tenant in Boland Farms that kind of covered a lot of our needs. We also had Cripple Creek for a lot of the season and New Roots for Refugees. The, um, that just, that whole, I, I have faith in what is offered at the market, I think is really critical for people to come down. Um, alcohol, drinks, of course, is part of that. I can, I can guarantee you um, a beverage, something to eat, um, and live music. But then that additional, if you're really coming to purchase something, I want you to feel like you'll find it when you come down. Um, so, of course, the, the measure of all measures is how likely would you recommend it to a friend, and we had a considerable jump in that respect, and I did feel that the sort of energy and pride in the season, and that you'll tell someone, you'll invite family and friends to come join you, it will be a place where we saw neighborhood groups, you know, on occasion joining us, um, so that feels really good, with referrals being the best form of flattery. So I think uh, covered some things. We did try, I haven't mentioned the special events that we really tried to work throughout the season. That came about as a debrief brainstorming session with some of our vendors and the mayor attended that as well. Just sort of thinking about if we can provide a layer additionally on top of the things that you shop for or the live music. Um, and I think we, the whole trick of it, I think to keep the energy up is that you have something to promote each week and some new thing to drive in your messaging and your campaigning and uh, you know that and you're targeting another audience. So one day it's dog owners and the other day it's people who like to salsa dance and you just keep playing with those kinds of themes and ideas throughout the season. So we really, I think even you know the hottest day of the year that was just absolutely miserable was the day that we had the salsa, salsa, salsa theme. And I think the, any, the reason anyone came that night was because of the, the themes and the activities that we had planned. So again, it's just insurance building against what you cannot control. Um, expanded region awareness, I really feel like that was true. We had $3,000 over a little bit in sponsorship revenue. And that's just a great way to invite more people in with an invested interest in being there and being there in a positive way. And uh, I think that expands our reach. Also, just our social media numbers have really risen a lot. In particular, Instagram and our email list uh, has really grown a lot. Um, I think I've mentioned most of those. So the growth opportunities, I've talked a lot about that with just where do we go from here in terms of investment in space and the infrastructure in the space, making it um, just, again, more comfortable in a variety of weather types. We did off. We did buy the Adirondack chairs, which I thought were a great addition. We hope to provide another picnic table and an umbrella for just that permanent seating in this space. But other than that, at this time, with the existing budget that we passed in 2020, we don't have plans for any large-scale investment. That's a conversation we can have going forward. But I think honestly, last year, you know, putting the budget together, we're thinking we still have something to, to test and try to see about what kind of concept this is going forward. So I think you know every year tells us a little bit more about how people want to be there and, and in what ways and what kind of investment is, is a good response to that. So that's where my head is. I think we still have plans for um, a very similar type programming in 2020 unless we hear otherwise um, from you all. But you know, spirits are high coming off of these numbers. Um, we had great support. I wanted to just shout out for um, staff, for Public Works in particular, with um, kind of tending to the market, doing trash collection, all of those things, but also just kind of in general support and brainstorming. <laughs> and then also police uh, had a presence there each week, which was great. We had some 
tent set up help from people who work at City Hall, so just really good support across the board, and also to our market coordinators, Carrie Dickerson and Kate Deacon, who uh, brought a lot to the program. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think the move to Thursday nights has been great. Um, yeah, the abbreviated. Yeah. I, I <laughs> abbreviated is good. I, I personally think we maybe could have gone a couple more weeks. It's just my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. not running the market either, so I know it takes a lot to pull yeah. off. Yeah, no, I mean, um, I don't know that a couple of weeks wouldn't hurt. It's just so easy to advertise yeah. new prerogatives. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just on the poster. But we could we could <clears> have that for sure. But yeah, it was a great turnout. I mean, every, yeah. every week seemed like it was a lot busier than any of the weeks I've ever yeah. in the last couple of years. Yeah. yeah, I need to thank Council and the Mayor too for coming and for hosting the ward meetings and mm -hmm. helping with volunteering and all of that. And we had the Chamber help with the volunteer night and several other groups, which was really key and good. So thanks for your support too. Is Capital Fed still considering putting an investment? On the yeah, we've just percent. recently kind of reinvigorated conversations with them to say kind of where are we, especially coming off of this season. Uh, we haven't had any kind of um, detailed conversations within the last few months, but it's still a possibility. And I think the, the design work that we did originally when that idea first came around still serves us in a lot of different ways um, with just some ideas that we could pull from when we're ready to. So just thinking about the space and that level of detail and seeing some of the designs on paper, I feel like served us well, but in terms of just actual next steps, we're still kind of at an impasse, but. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I was just going to say, I think we need a couple more tables that we could, we can sneak them into the budget. Um, yeah. Are you thinking like the folding table type? Yeah, yeah, just a couple of folding tables. I think especially, you know, with our Communities for All Ages push and stuff, there yeah. are a lot of, on the busier weeks, where people will having to stand around and wait to kind of try to get a spot. And yes, yeah. And one thing I think that will be helpful is we now that we have an alcohol vendor each week, we've moved away from the third Thursday concept, or we're still kind of in that no man's land where we had them last year, but or this year rather. Um, but really, what is the difference between any of the amazing fun nights you can have at the market versus those? And so it serves us in certain ways where we can kind of guarantee higher attendance to our vendors on those nights. Um, or maybe they're targets for people to plan around, but I think you could kind of remove those and then you just have consistent seating to a certain level that hits your average across the board. So I feel like we're kind of still figuring that out a little bit. Great. Any other questions for Ellen? Thank you. Okay, next up we have action items, of which we have three. And first up is the approval of the September 4th, 2019 Community Development Committee Minutes. Those were included in your packet if anyone has any changes or corrections. Okay. All right. Next up is item number four, agency participation agreement with Mark and TTS for data authorization. Celia Turan. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's a little difficult to follow all those fun presentations. <laughs> we'll go technical now. Um, this item is really an agreement to consider between Mission, um, Mid-America Regional Council, and TTS to share traffic signal data. And they're going to use this data as part of the OGL, Operation Greenlight System, to try to develop new technology related to connected vehicles. Questions do we have for Celia? We've we participated in this in the past, right? Yeah, we participate in Operation Greenlight, but we never share the data with another traffic company, and it's really going through Mark, but allowing them to look at our data. Sure. And there are no costs. No costs. Yes. Okay. Let's lay in the <laughs> yeah, for you, always good. <laughs> Next up, we have item number five, demolition contract for 5122 West 60th Terrace property. Brent Morgan. Thank you. Um, on September 18, 2019, council approved uh, the acquisition of the property uh, located at 5122 West 60th Terrace. Um, this is anticipation of the Rock Creek Channel project that's hopefully going to be starting this spring um, through the engineers and talking about the development of this project, uh, we needed to acquire a property on the south side of the Creek Channel for the construction of the Creek Channel walls itself. 
and we also need uh, early access for soil borings. Um, behind these properties is the tallest wall of this project. Uh, at some points it's 40 feet tall, so we really need to know what's behind that wall and how to design it. Uh, the bids were uh, requested, I mean solicited, August through September 2019. Um, Denton Excavating uh, was the lowest qualified bidder. They have also done workforce in town in the last five years. Uh, they took down Ned Printing, um, also Harley Woods. We never really had any issues with them. They've been a good contractor. Um, they're usually one of the lower bidders in the, you know, when you solicit bids, but they do do a good job, and we haven't had any issues with them. The property owner um, has had some settlement and erosion issues along that uh, creek channel. Um, I was out there about a week ago on site just, you know, working with some of these demo contractors. And in the last two weeks, his second fence he's put up has fallen into the creek channel. So, I mean, we're making the right move of fixing this creek channel and uh, stopping these erosion issues for the property owners out there. Um, so staff's recommending a contract with uh, Denton Excavating and Midland Wrecking amount not to exceed $9,748 and that's complete demolition that's utilities getting disconnected sanitary getting disconnected water getting disconnected um, the foundation the basement's coming out uh, the house is coming down and all of it's getting hauled off to a certified landfill so we're disposing of it in the right way how we're supposed to okay. what questions do we have for Brent? Solid. Um, are there any measures to check the grading for the neighboring property owners and how the demo is going to affect them, you know, any flooding or further erosion issues while the project's going on? So it's it's backfill uh, the foundation and get it to grade towards the street or towards the creek channel right now until the construction project's complete. Um, so it's just backfilling the site, you know, where we're not going to be affecting the neighbor's properties, but just getting that water to flow. Because uh, once they start bringing the big equipment on that side, I mean, it's, they're going to have to keep grading it out and making sure that drainage is right. So we're just getting it seeded to where it's not going to affect the property owners right now. And then we'll have to kind of dial that in once this project gets going. And where are we with communication with the neighbors? Um, we are working through the easements right now. Um, we are going to need some access for some more soil warnings. So we are, um, got that information from GBA recently and uh, working through track maps and working on getting easements, uh, and we'll be talking to all those neighbors here soon. So they'll know the anticipation of the project coming. So they, they, we sent a letter, and I think I sent you all a copy of that. So when at the end of August, we sent a letter that just sort of introduced the project. Uh, as we knew, we were going to start to see the surveyors <coughs> out and sort of tr tramping around in the creek channel. Uh, so that went out, and that indicated that we were currently working on the easement documents and that we would be in touch with property owners where we needed easements within you know, 30 to 60 days. So we're right at that time frame. We're ready to initiate those conversations. Um, the other thing that we did indicate in that letter was that sometime later this fall, and we're not quite there yet, that we would host kind of a neighborhood or community meeting. So as we get a little further in the design process, uh, and we have the opportunity to really answer more of the specific questions that we know the residents will have, we'll do a postcard mailer. And all that. So we'll probably send a, another letter in the next 45 days or so. All that information. Okay. Any other questions? Consent or non consent? Consent. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up we have discussion items, which there are none, but we do have department updates from Laura Smith. Do we have any? I don't think I have any. I did have just one question I want to bring up, just something that had come up um, related to the stoplight on Rowe and Johnson Drive and the potential Roman Park annexation. Um, do we know or could we find out if in the future we needed to make changes to that stoplight, what that process would look like and would that process change if half of that stoplight ended up being in Roland Park versus just a quarter of it? Or is it a KDOT thing or when you say changes, just in terms of timing of the signal or modification. Yeah, timing, modification if we had to add turn signals or take away turn signals or do something different with that intersection. You know, let's say that you know, the gateway finally happens, but there's some big traffic change that we have to try to make there. Is it beneficial at all for us or does it make any difference even um, if half of that stoplight ends up being in the wrong park versus not? 
I don't think so because we're at that intersection. We're going to be doing traffic engineering and, and looking at um, movements and turning patterns and all of those kinds of things. So we would be working in cooperation. And I, what what we sent the letter that went to KCPNL from Roland Park, indicating they were going to assume that 25% responsibility. Said you know basically wanted to make sure that they had a seat at the table in those conversations. The letter that we sent said the same thing. So I think it would be a collaborative. Uh, effort going forward if we needed to make changes at that intersection. Okay. okay. I believe that concludes our Community Development Committee. Is that anyone need a break or we good? Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So it is uh, 7.25 and we'll call our Finance and Administration Committee meeting to order. Uh, first up, public comments. Does anyone have a public comment on anything not on our agenda tonight? Um, we don't have any public presentations tonight, and so we will move into our action items. First up for our action items is approval of the September 4th, 2019 Finance and Administration Committee minutes. Martha. Minutes were in the packet. If anyone has any corrections or changes. Minutes were fantastic. <laughs> All right. um, next, we have the upgrade of our laser fish software. Also, Martha and Emily. <laughs> we didn't really coordinate our talking to myself. Well, they were sort of arm wrestling. There's some degree of coordination. I'm right here. I'm right we have used LaserFish since um, 2009, and it is our repository for our final documents. Um, at this time, we would like to upgrade it so that it we can use the enhanced capabilities that have been developed over time and um, allow us to have fillable forms and a variety of um, routing capabilities, uh, just in, provide improved customer service for those um, that need to submit a variety of forms and applications. The cost, the total cost is $10,738, and that does um, include a credit that we are getting for our current system. Our uh, maintenance will go up a little bit annually, but um, not too much, about $1,600 a year. Uh, all the staff has access to LaserFish currently, and um, we also have it on our website with public has access to a variety of documents also. So it's been super beneficial with the search capabilities that it has. Oftentimes when we're looking for something really obscure, once it's been scanned into LaserFish to be able to just quickly search that, it's really been helpful. So. Mm -hmm. okay. Any questions? This is a great thing for consent. Great thing for consent? All right. Uh, next, I'm guessing we'll have a little more discussion on this one. Award of our contract for solid waste collection services. Brian. Hello. Thank you. So we currently have a contract for residential solid waste collection in the city. Uh, we've had it for just about seven years now. It was with Death and Ball. They were bought out a few years ago by Waste Management. So Waste Management is now we're contracting for that service. Um, it consists of solid waste collection, recyclable materials collection, yard waste collection, from all residential properties in the city of Mission. And residential properties is defined as three units or less, so triplexes, duplexes, or single family homes. It does not include apartments. They are considered commercial property for the purposes of the ordinance, and so they own their commercial contracts. Um, the collection is once a week. And then for solid waste, it's anything that fits into a 65 gallon polycar container. More can be placed in a sealed trash bag with an overage sticker that can be purchased at City Hall or the Community Center. 
Recyclable materials are certain items that can be recycled to fit within a 65 gallon poly cart. Um, or if you manage to fill up the poly cart and you still have more recyclables, you can put them in a bin marked recyclable or have the universal recyclable symbol on it. Uh, so recycling is unlimited. So the more you can recycle, the better. And then finally, yard waste, um, grass clippings, leaves, branches, and other vegetation that can be placed in a paper bag or bundled. Uh, we limit uh, the collection to eight bags January through October. And then in November and December, we allow 12 bags of collection. And if you have more than that, uh, you're welcome to put those out of the curb with an over sticker in each bag. And we also have once a month bulky item pickup limited to three items. So when we put together the bids, we try to mirror the invitation for bids to those services that we already offer. So we try to make it very like, so it's kind of apples to apples comparison. Um, this is a map of our solid waste collection service area. We have four different service areas. We collect on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And one of those areas gets picked up on one of those days of the week. And again, when we put together the invitation for bid, we supplied this, provided this to the bidders and said we'd like to try to keep this as is now. If you have something else that you want to propose, efficient. This would be your opportunity to do so, but this is kind of the base that we're starting with. So with that, uh, we received three bids back. All of them bid on the like services and the service area. Nobody proposed any changes. Um, we received a bid from WCA, a bid from Republic, and then a bid from our current provider, Waste Management. Current contract with waste management is $16.97 per household. And that includes um, not only the services I listed in the previous slide, but it also includes uh, pick up a city facility. So if you're at City Hall, the in factory in the summer months, uh, public works facility, and the community center. Um, they do charge for a 40 uh, yard dumpster at the public works facility. It's kind of picked up when as needed. So it's not a routine schedule once a week or twice a week. Um, so that's an extra charge about that $16.97. We just pay for that out of the public works budget. Um, WCA proposed um, $16.04. Um, they kind of broke their costs down between households and city facilities. But that's an all in cost. We combine those two together. And Republic did 22.16, the waste management was 17.99 per household. So with that, um, I met with the folks from WCA, the low bidder, and um, really kind of went through the proposal, asked lots of questions, fine-tuned things. Um, I think we're all kind of in agreement that we want to continue to provide like services to our residents. They are able to provide the polycart containers that we requested in the bid um, in the format that we requested. Um, they are going to provide um, trucks. My understanding, and they can clarify this in their presentation, is that they will actually be using rental trucks for the first few months of the new service year, um, which is quite a bit of lead time in purchasing trucks and getting those ready. Um, but the new trucks should be here sometime this winter in service. Um, from those discussions, we worked on defining an agreement for residential solid waste services, which is in your contract. And we really focused in on, um, I can focus in on drafting this, defining terms. Um, the terms in the current contract are not very well defined. I think sometimes are sort of left up debate between the service provider and staff. So we really spent some time defining the terms. Um, specifically defining weekly solid waste collection, recycling collection, monthly collection of bulky items, what is curbside collection, what's house line collection for hardship situations, 
And those are cases where if a resident is unable to take their trash physically out to the curb, um, and they can at least be able to get that into the trash can of the polycar itself and leave it in front of the house. Uh, they can call the city or better yet, call the service provider and they will come, actually get out of the truck, walk up to the house, bring it up to the curb, dump it, and take it back to the house. Um, talk a little bit about holiday schedule, um, in particular inclement weather, um, either extreme cold days or extreme heat days, uh, whatever the case may be. And then we really got into service standards. And um, I think this has been kind of a frustration of staff over the years in dealing with uh, both death and blog and waste management. Communication to residents, uh, dealing with service requests, uh, timely response, etc. So, uh, WCA will be required to provide a resident communication within approximately 10 business days after notice to proceed of the contract. And that communication will go to all households in the city and provide the name of the service provider, a toll free telephone number for customer service concerns and requests a web page address, an email address for service request, the collection day in that particular area, and the holidays observed by the service provider, and any alternate collection days are appropriate. We'll also provide information about how to handle solid waste and yard waste, and especially some informational material, educational material, and recycled materials. So what is recycled material? It's acceptable, it's not acceptable. The service provider, this was something that really kind of um, struck the chord with me in reviewing the uh, proposals. Uh, WCA is willing to provide a city designated website. So this would be a website for the city of Michigan. We could provide a link on our website directly to that website, direct our residents to that, and we specifically outline the services that are provided to our residents as opposed to more generic level service that you might get a larger corporation. Uh, services offered to the city through this agreement, service areas and collection days, hours of collections, holidays observed, notices of change to collection services due to inclement weather or another unforeseen event. So it's snowing hard the night before and they can't quite get out in the morning. The idea is they can at least post that on their website. So if people are wondering how my trash not be picked up, go to the website and Ships information there. And then again, regulations and information on the preparation of solid waste, recyclables, and yard waste. Um, the customer Service Center, uh, WCA, would provide a toll free telephone line for receiving concerns or requests. Uh, telephone line will be staffed by trained personnel between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Central Standard Time, Monday through Friday. Calls will be answered promptly. Those answering the telephone line will need to be familiar with the city's agreement for residential solid waste collection services. And that was something that's very important for us. And be able to answer questions and address concerns specific to the agreement. In cases where there's an exceptionally high call load, calls may be pulled over to a voicemail box, but must be returned within an hour after receipt. So our expectation is that the call may begin during a snow event. You don't necessarily get someone live, you can just do a voicemail message and that call will return within an hour. Um, and then calls are left overnight with the answer first thing in the morning. Um, email is the same. Collection service standards. Um, service concerns or requests received by the contractor WCA before noon central time of the collection day must be addressed before close of business that day. And service concerns or requests received by the contractor after noon central time of the collection day must be addressed before close of business the following day. If a concern or service request regards a spillage of solid waste or recyclable yard waste, whatever the case may be, that needs to be addressed within the hour. Field representative provided. Let me see it provide. Brian, I'm sorry, real quick, just with um, collection service standards, by you saying addressed, does that mean resolved? Cleaned up. Okay, yeah. so take so if 
the, there's a pickup missed, it has to be resolved by the end of that business day. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We received a call before noon on that day. It's, you come home in the work, you see that your solid waste is still sitting out, you call and leave an email. You should have gone by the next day. Uh, monthly service reports. This is something else that intrigued me. Uh, WCA provides uh, monthly service reports to all of their customer cities. Um, so details, the type of service requests that were received, how those were handled, um, any particular issues that might have come up. Uh, they meet on a regular basis with their members or customer city representatives to go over those service reports. There's also information about the amounts that are collected in terms of recycling and solid waste. Um, and we have specific provisions for equipment utilized. The contract will be obligated to provide the number and type of trucks necessary to effectively perform the services outlined in this agreement. Trucks will be identified with the name of the contractor. Um, should not be more than five years in age. It should be kept safe, clean, and sanitary conditions. Uh, the term for this particular agreement um, is initial term of five years with an option to renew for another five year, two additional optional renewals. So that would be a total of 15 years. The city shows it acting with two additional optional renewals. about subcontractors, section 5.4 of the contract of the agreement, contractor supervision. The contractor will supervise and direct and will work performed shall be responsible for its employees. The contractor will also supervise and direct the work performed by subcontractors and their employees and be responsible for the work performed by subcontractors hired by the contractor. Contractor shall not assign responsibilities to any subcontractor without the prior written approval of the city, which may be granted at the sole discretion of the city. Section 6.4, contract repair of damages. Um, this stipulates that if any property is damaged by the contractor, requirements for having it repaired. That was not in the previous contract, and that was an issue once or twice. And there's some of the legalese. So those are the highlights of the contract. Uh, Appendix A, the contract, um, calls out acceptable recyclable materials. And this, of course, can change as industry standards change. Um, we have a service map that's shown on the slide included in this. And in Appendix C, we have the city facilities, collection rates, and the frequency of collection, and the rates of collection. So, now Tom Coffin and Carrie, help me pronounce your last name? Calabrese. Calabrese, thank you, is here this evening. And they have a brief presentation as well, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. I'm the district manager of uh, WCA. I think you all know this popular man here, Tom Kaufman. Uh, he's our municipal sales rep uh, for the district. So um, let's talk a little trash and recycling and who we are. Uh, so we are WCA. We uh, got into the market back in 2015 from a collection standpoint via acquisition from town and country. Um, and we've kind of established ourselves here as a fully integrated uh, district within WCA, so fully integrated meaning we collect process material um, from garbage, MSW, C&D, uh, 
uh, for recyclables. Company Outlook, we're, we span across 11 states. Um, we're split into nine districts, one being this district, which has established itself as the Missouri North District. Uh, specifically, we have five hauling companies. Uh, in the metro, we have one to the east of downtown, off the Truman Road. Uh, we have one in Harrisonville as well, um, in Grand Valley, Chillicothe, and Sedalia. Chillicothe and Sedalia don't really impact y'all, but figured I'd give you the landscape. Uh, we operate four transfer stations, uh, two locally, one in Kansas City uh, to the east of town and also one in Harrisonville. Uh, and we have a landfill in Sedalia. We also have a MRF that's located in Harrisonville as well, which we'll get to on the other slides. But uh, that's kind of the lay of the land uh, for the Missouri North District. As a company, we're a broad footprint, but a narrow focus. Um, so the takeaway there is, you know, we're a big company. We have resources that some of the larger companies have that you guys are used to dealing with. But we have a local feel, right? Um, I would challenge Republic or Waste or anybody to have a district manager or a general manager come talk to you, but it's important to us, right? We give you the local feel, the small feel. Uh, we are not decentralized by any means. Uh, we have full autonomy as districts. I report directly to the COO. Um, I have full authority to make a lot of decisions that some of the larger companies have not already taken. Um, what we do have locally as well is we have a local safety program uh, with safety director. We've got a local CSR program, as, as Brian mentioned, uh, with six CSRs and one CSR manager. All of our dispatching is local. All of our route supervisors are local. So we are both best of both worlds from large to small scale. So we give you that little extra touch. You've got Tom, who's your direct line uh, for, for any issues that you need to get resolved. You've got me as well. Um, so no, yeah, we're all phone call away. Uh, so that's really the point I wanted to drive home here. Um, you can see just kind of how large we are, a couple metrics there um, that I'll let you read at your leisure. Um, speaking about fleet in your communities, something that you're very familiar with is the style of truck that Defenball uh, currently runs. This is what our automated truck is that's going to pick up solid waste and recycling. It's called a Corrado. Um, it's an AFL. That's our spec automated truck. Reason being is it's forward facing. Uh, a lot of automated trucks that are used are kind of backward facing where the driver's using their mirrors. We believe in this from a safety standpoint because it's heads up in front of you, uh, you know, tipping cans that you can always see. And of course, we got the traditional rear loader for the bulky items in the road. So, like Brian mentioned, you'll get the new, new vehicles coming in uh, from the automated collection standpoint. Uh, we will have to rent them whether I dispatch the rentals in here or just send newer trucks in here is to be known, but uh, you'll have your own brand new trucks uh, in the city uh, once awarded the contract. Uh, speaking of our MRF, uh, it's one or two in the market of, of what I call single stream processors of size. Uh, we generate about, uh, process about 4,000 tons of recycling each month. Uh, pretty large, robust facility. Um, naturally, all of our uh, recyclables go there in some form or fashion. Uh, they, they're delivered there and processed and sold to market. A little bit on sustainability. Uh, we've got our landfill in Sedalia, like I mentioned. Uh, we do have a um, gas to energy plant there that we're actually going to upgrade here in the future. Uh, in our five year plan, um, we're actually going to put a more robust high BTU gas system there that will deliver um, natural gas into the pipeline that can be reused for CNG fuel, uh, actually. So that's in the works for us. Also, speaking on CNG, uh, we're going through a facility upgrade uh, at our Kansas City location uh, off of Truman, where we will add infrastructure for CNG. Um, and uh, we will start to slowly uh, implement our CNG fleet plan here. Prior slide, we, we our, our sustainability report. We talk about how much we do have in terms of CNG infrastructure. Texas is heavily CNG. Florida is heavily CNG. Uh, the next natural platform for us as a company would be this district. Um, briefly touched on some of our leadership. Again, locally, um, you got myself, uh, my my right hand operations man, Don Cartwright. Mike Martin is our residential supervisor that will be assigned to the city. Uh, Mike Martin is a very popular guy amongst Fairway, Roland Park, and uh, Westwood. 
He takes good care of those communities and will do the same for you guys. Um, Jenny King's our customer service manager. Um, she's the one that kind of puts together the reports Brian alluded to uh, that, that kind of shows how our service delivery is. Uh, we're not bashful about um, how good we are <laughs> and we'll share that with y'all. Uh, we have Sadie Gardner who is uh, in charge of our Murph marketing and sales. Um, you know, Sadie, the word marketing is in there for a reason because we like to partner her with communities to kind of help recycling efforts um, and especially contamination rates because the cleaner the product we're getting, the better we are on the back end. Uh, and then, of course, the town call. Uh, in the community, we just have some <coughs> local examples. Um, you know, we've got uh, Roland Park, Fairway, Westwood, firework display that, that we uh, donated to the fireworks for Fourth of July. Uh, we have a Fairway Touch a Truck event where we'll bring a truck out on a weekend and, and kind of educate the kiddos on them. Um, they like big garbage trucks, they're fascinated, but also talk about some safety components of the garbage trucks. Uh, and then we've got a Roland Park donation there to their uh, art sculpture, I believe it was, yeah. A couple examples of uh, public se sector partnerships. Um, I'll let you all read through that, but uh, you know, pretty prevalent in the market. Uh, try to grow that footprint. And uh, that's about all I've got from a high level who we are. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of questions, so I will try not to take much more of y'all's time, but uh, we'll be glad to field those questions if you got Do you guys offer any glass recycling at all? We don't. Okay. Ripple's got the market on that. Um, my question might be more for Brian. Brian, what was the Sustainability Commission's role in selection of WCA? selection process, but I included them on drafting the IFB. So Emily recruited a couple members, and once we had a draft we felt we were comfortable with, we sent that out to them to get their input. Um, I'll be honest, it's mostly just not catching typos and things like that. So it didn't really have a whole lot to add beyond it was already in. I was talking about with the facility upgrade. Uh, in 2020, we're going to upgrade our Kansas City facility, which is off of Truman. Uh, and in that upgrade, in our five year plan, is to infuse CNG infrastructure. Okay, so that's what the yeah. car. I'm not yeah. sure what that happened yeah. So that's what you're talking about. Using some wheel. Yeah. And then what happens to all the old cars? I mean, you guys decide to go. We actually or? do. We do. We have uh, part of our rebranding effort. We have a lot of old branded town and country carts. Um, that we run through our plant and sell them to the market. And then one of our ordinances actually discuss recyclable carts must be made with 25% recyclable plastics. So I didn't know if that was... I got you. <laughs> yeah, well, our, our vendor, Sierra, is who we plan to use. Right, they, I didn't see anything yeah, in there. That they they've got a 25%, that. no problem. Okay. Kristen, when you were asking about old cards, you asked about the collection of the cards? Yeah, I was wondering, but it sounds like you may agree with Rand some of them. And no, no, okay, so I won't touch waste, sorry, good yeah. good clarification. Okay. So from a waste, I won't touch those, but what we do internally is when we have old busted up cards that aren't reusable, we do recycle. Okay. But okay. waste management, so I can't, okay. I can't touch okay. them. Yeah, no. That's one of those service requests, you know, my car got busted mm -hmm. today, was hit by something, call them, they'll come out and replace it. But in terms of the cards that are out there right now, you have know, Death and Law's name on them or Waste Management's right. name on them. Once you all approve the contract, if you do, um, then I will notify Waste Management formally that we're switching callers and I'll negotiate with them a time, probably two times, for them to come in. We'll have to work with WCA. And really the idea is going to be as they drive down the street that last time and took the car into their truck, Somebody will be behind to pick up that cart, put on a trailer, and WCA will be following behind the new cart there. Okay. So in theory, if you come home at the end of the day, you'll have a WCA cart there instead of a. That would be the perfect way for it to work. Um, that might be a bit of a challenge. I've heard that a little bit of 
the problem with Prairie Village. Right, yeah. So um, kind of drive that home with with the folks at Waste Management. Um, but we've been kind of talking about the what ifs. You know, what if not everybody gets their card out, someone's gone for the holidays. That's the unfortunate thing about this, that transition curve right around the holidays. So we'll probably work to have uh, waste manager come through a couple times, not just once, but two or three times. And then final time, if there's still carts out there, we may just go through ourselves and collect them, throw them in the back of the city dump truck, and okay. take them back to our facilities and come and get them, or do something with them. Hopefully those will be That would be some city expense possibly yeah. in that part, okay. Carrie, we spent considerable time just talking about service level expectations. Um, so do you have, do you think you have a pretty good idea? And I know Tom does, because Tom lives in our community, but um, do you have a pretty good idea of the kind of city we are and the service level expectations that we have? Yeah, I think your expectations line with mine. Okay. Um, you know, 99.9999% like is what my success rate is the standard. Uh, so. You know, I think within the Mark cities, we, we carry that out with every day. Um, but yeah, we, we have the same standard. Okay. You know, cable TV, right? Ninja. We want to be the ninjas where we just come in, trash is gone. I know I'm doing a good job if I don't have to talk to you. <laughs> so, so yes, I understand it, and it doesn't doesn't shy us around away from it at all. So. Another question? Yeah, um, so kind of along those same lines, there's been some negative press um, for WCA, particularly in Kansas City, Missouri, in the North End area, um, Leewood, and a lot, I, you know, your credit has been years past, but just wondering what's changed since some of those stories, and a lot of them were naked due to sub subcontracting quality, and, yeah, and what's yeah. changed with that? Um, you know, I think that from the days past where you had a lot of friction costs from a transition integration, standpoint when we purchase a water trawler uh, that both waste and us experience. I would say that um, the management team is completely different. Um, we've got different local leadership with different expectations. Um, at one point before I got out here, uh, I believe our turnover rate was in excess of 120 uh, percent. We are sub 40s now uh, and that stabilized us. And I just think that uh, you know the culture that we've developed has also helped us as well um, to to minimize and mitigate any service disruptions. Kansas City thing is unfortunate because there's a lot to that piece, and that was due to a subcontractor. Um, I won't get into those details, but uh, that that's an unfortunate situation that that we are in uh, that we worked through and, and mitigated on our own dime the best we could as well. So. And kind of sorry. Yep. Along those same lines, um, with kind of your workforce stability, um, how what percentage do you subcontract out um, in this district? Yeah. So not. I mean, I would not. I don't plan to sub out anything in your community. Um, where we have the largest piece of subcontractor is our Kansas City Missouri contract, and that's just the way it was established. Um, so it's something that I've got to live through. Um, but no, we try to be. Um, what I'll call own our own destiny and not uh, rely on others. We do use subcontractors for yard waste in some areas, um, but they're proven, Compost Connection is a proven commodity of the market that provides a good service, so we, we strategically pick them uh, carefully. So, But we, we, we want to be independent of subcontractors. Is any of WCA union? I have a couple questions um, for you, too, uh, tied to the environmental piece. So you mentioned a five-year plan on the CNG upgrades. Is there any sort of timeline that you'd be willing to commit to CNG trucks for mission? There's not. Um, all I know is in the five-year plan, so now this is kind of decision makers above me. Uh, what's been communicated to me is this is the next natural progression, right? So it's, it's part of our sustainability plan. Uh, and it's frankly something that we need and can leverage here. So I would say, if I had to, you know, don't write it down, I'd say 18 to 24 months. All right. And even if we get new trucks now, would you be willing to write into the contract that we get, you know, that first round of natural gas trucks when they're ready? 
And then I had a question about how the transfer station versus landfill and how that all works in terms of the transportation yep. impact um, with your trash pickup. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so um, another delivery point, really. Uh, naturally, we're not going to take route trucks to Sedalia. But uh, it's a it's a throughput uh, where we dump trash into a transfer station, we load them on the semi trucks, and then take them out to Sedalia. Um, so we've done some things there too that have kind of what I'll call enhanced efficiency, uh, and by enhancing efficiency, naturally has helped our sustainability. But uh, we've made a significant investment there to where we're getting six to eight less loads a day um, because we've built up more capacity on our trailers uh, and the way we load. So we are seeing six to eight less trucks leave that transfer station to transport the same amount of garbage. So, you know, naturally we, we do have to travel a little bit further, but again, that whole ecosystem of that natural gas plant upgrade, we'll burn the diesel, we'll create CNG, we'll put it back into the pipeline, so it kind of goes full force. So. The semis will still be diesel though, right? They will be. Okay. Yes, they will be. Um, I, could you walk me through, um, this might seem kind of elementary, but could you walk me through that in the dark waste and its process? Yeah, so. <laughs> I've been more. Gets bagged. Really gets bagged. Gets thrown into the truck on the left. Down on the right there, with the guy standing on the back, those are then, uh, then we literally transport it to um, Missouri Organics, which they then process it, put it in windrows, and mulch it, and reuse it, uh, however they fill, but usually they remulch it and sell it to the public, things like that. So that, that's, it's pretty simple process. Pick it up, throw it in, take it to Missouri Organics, they process it, let it kind of oxidize, and then create mulch. And Um, what is your cleanup process if like a hydraulic line breaks on one of your trucks? Yep. So uh, we have spill kits on all of our trucks. All of our drivers are trained on how to use those spill kits. First priority is contain because um, we don't want it going into any runways of uh, water flow or sewers. So they're taught to contain it um, and then we they have floor dry as well to not only contain it but then somewhat mitigate it from spreading and getting worse and people driving through it. Uh, but then we usually dispatch out our um, service truck. They come up with more reinforcements to contain it even more, clean it up even more, and then we have a uh, group that comes out and actually cleans it. And I'm assuming that also entails communication with the city if that happens? Yeah, usually we let you know, we're like, hey, we've got a hydraulic leak on Johnson Street. Um, just let you know about it. service to our community and buy new equipment, they do, do need to re realize some return in that investment. Okay. So. Any other questions for anyone?
Next up, we have adoption of our 2019 Standard Traffic Ordinance, STO, and Uniform Public Offense Code, UPOC. Uh-oh, we have a substitute. No, wait, no, are you on the list? Who are on the list? Uh, I'm on there. <laughs> I'm Ben and Kevin Bowe. So, important uh, information about your chief. So, I was living in Shawnee off 69, or I was about three years old. I was a leader not still in a diaper. And I used to go around on Wednesdays and pick up the trash. <laughs> and got to go put it in the dumpster, and that's back when they used to put their hand in and roll the cart and everything, and I actually got to push the button to have the smasher come down. So, uh, that's what Let us know. We can let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. Pass the drug test. Retire. <laughs> uh, next up, we have adoption of so before you, uh, as we do every year, uh, is the 2019, the state STO and UPOC uh, manuals um, a little bit later than usual. Uh, we'll tell you that the state went through and did a lot of cleanup um, to ensure that everything was following the state statute. Um, all of that information is in the packets that, that you got from League of Municipalities and ordinances that uh, the city and Dave Martin worked on. Um, there are some things that we have opted out in the STO and the UPOC because our city ordinances that the governing body, you and the people before you have decided uh, gives us better enforcement and better leverage and leeway to be able to uh, manage some of these things. And those involve speed limits and smoking ordinances and things of that nature. So I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have about any of the things that we're Do you know anything about the impacts of this SB 28? The Changes around marijuana usage or products containing THC. So, so the the federal government and the state, um, obviously, you cannot um, medical marijuana is, is another piece. Um, what what I would tell you is is there there are a lot of things happening all across Kansas and Missouri both. Um, I have all kinds of documentation downstairs from KDOT that talks about uh, marijuana usage overall. Um, and as I explained to this council before, I, I sit on one side of that because I've seen some of the accidents and I know the, the rates of uh, medical marijuana versus marijuana that has THC in it. Um, I've worked a lot of those fatality accidents and I will tell you that our drug arrests are up this year and it's not just marijuana, it's meth, cocaine. LSD, things of that nature. Um, I, I can see the medical marijuana and everything uh, moving forward as, as, as it has. Um, and I've had people tell me that they can actually help cure the brain tumor that's a rare form of cancer that's in my head. Um, we have a lot of these shops that are opening up and there's a lot of businesses that sell CBD oil in this, in this city, but I will tell you that THC is illegal. So, it looks like it just a, I'm just trying to wrap my head around mm -hmm. this, this kind of legalese, but according to this, it looks like if you have a doctor's note that you were, mm -hmm. with, with these standard statutes that you'd be able to possess marijuana, I guess? Is, you could at least present yeah. an affirmative defense yeah. as to why you had it. Sure. Yes, yes I think that's exactly yeah. you'd have, you'd have to have, Senate bill. You'd have to have a doctor's note. So. And that seems to be... I guess this must be adopted throughout most of the state that it's in the standard ordinances that are being Correct. One, once, so these laws went into effect July 1st. Um, and we, we bring these before you to actually uh, adopt the SDO and the UPOC as it's, as it's written. Unless the changes are in there, which is at the bottom of page one and the top of page two. Um, some of those articles. Yeah. So. On those big lists in the league summary for both the traffic and the criminal code, my understanding from talking to Laura is you guys had the fun of going through every single one, but are there any pieces that you think you know, we should draw our attention to? Or no, I, particular changes? You know, it's uh, one, one of the things that, uh, that I come across in here is uh, school zones. Uh, the school zone fines, uh, the state recommends that the fines are doubled. Um, our, our typical uh, through the city ordinances is that you add $50 to the fine, it's not double. Oh, for speeding tickets? Right, for speeding tickets in school zones. Gotcha. Um, there's also uh, parts in here when it talks about, um, as you know, business districts and residential can be 
certain speed limits is appropriated by the state. The city has the right to change those, which the city has done. Um, and you can also not lower speed limits below 20 miles an hour in a school zone. So you, you can't reduce it to 10 or 15 miles an hour. I think one of the things that we saw this year with the way they reorganized was that probably the, the areas where we continue to pay attention also deal with the animal cruelty, dangerous animal, animal control statutes. Um, and there was a change this year that it implemented some restrictions on the use of scooters. Um, we also have some additional ability to regulate it by passing an ordinance and knowing that's a topic that the council has discussed, um, we'll, we know we'll be bringing that back to you to see if there is a local ordinance that you want to adopt relative to that. Have we seen much scooter use? We haven't in ours. I mean, I know that uh, in Fairway, there was a big drop-off, um, and that's kind of started. So we all sort of had the antenna up, like, is this coming to Northeast Johnson County? We haven't seen as much of it as I think we thought we might, but um, it's out there still. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Consent, non-consent? Consent, non Thank you. Thank you. All right, we don't have any discussion items tonight. Any department updates, Laura? Uh, just a couple. I know last year we uh, had talked about trying to get our legislative program wrapped up and presented uh, a little earlier so that our legislators would actually have the opportunity to have that further in advance of the start of the session. So <clears throat> I know Councilmember Four and I. I have just recently been discussing that. Um, so if you have issues that you would like to uh, submit for consideration or inclusion in the legislative program, if you want to send them those to my attention, we'll kind of start to compile that. Uh, it, it appears that for the second year in a row, the county is not going to um, sort of lead the charge with a joint city-county legislative platform. So we'll be a little more on our own uh, with regard to that. But we can start that process. Um, also, uh, thank you for responding to the email. It looks like we are going to be in a position to have a supplemental committee meeting of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. Um, just to kind of give you an overview. What we, because of sort of the detail level of some of the things that we'll talk about, particularly as it relates to the Gateway Project, we didn't want to just drop that on your agenda this mm -hmm. evening uh, without the opportunity to review that. But I think you're all familiar with the fact that we know that the existing development agreement for the Gateway Project was based on phasing and a construction schedule that was anticipated uh, back in 2017. We know that has changed. Uh, and so we've been working with the developer and their attorneys on some revisions to the development agreement that would bring it to kind of uh, match up with the current circumstances of the project so that the council could reconsider um, the terms of that. And then additionally, uh, there are some administrative sort of what I would call more housekeeping issues related to cleanup of a TIF district. So in this area, we have a very large TIF district. There have been some sort of changes or interpretations about uh, increment, positive and neg negative increment within districts with multiple project plan areas. We'll become much clearer with maps next week, which is why I didn't want to really start to tackle it. But both of these issues uh, are really kind of kind of resetting the house, uh, if you will, for our conversations about um, financing, particularly financing related to this project. So we would look to have uh, those items on next Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. As I mentioned, uh, we, we will also have the draft of the ordinance, uh, de-annexation ordinance, that would be coming before you on the October 16th meeting uh, for the Northeast Corner there at uh, Johnson Drive and Row. The last thing I would have is, I think I've heard from most of you about potential dates for a council retreat. It appears that, and I'm not sure that it's entirely accurate, but there may be one Saturday between now and the end of the year when everybody might be available. It looks like at this point it's October 26th, based on what you all submitted to me. So if you wouldn't mind um, checking that, it looks like even then, uh, with weekdays, the best week
weekday opportunity that we would have, and, and we may not be able to get everyone. I mean, you all schedules are in, incredibly busy, um, but the evening of the 29th of October, which is a Tuesday, also seemed to the stars or the water seemed to part a little bit there. So, if you can look at October 26th and October 29th, and at least give me some initial feedback, I know everyone is anxious to kind of get that retreat going and get started talking about those kinds of projects. The other thing um, that I did send an email about that that based on <coughs> excuse me the, the amendments or the changes to the TIP district, there is a 30-day notice provision that is required there. Uh, we originally when we were looking to line this up, we were going to the October 16th uh, City Council meeting to November 20th as we were looking at that a little more in depth yesterday. We realized that four of you are going to be gone at that November 20th City Council meeting because of the National League of Cities Conference. Um, didn't feel like with some of the items that we think are going to come forward that it made sense to ask you to either remote in or try to participate remotely in that. So I uh, wanted to check availability on the 18th. The 18th is really the soonest that we could um, have that meeting. And then most of the four, I think the four that are gone, or at least three of the four are gone most of the rest of that week. You can let me know your availability on the 18th of November for the, the city council meeting in November, and then uh, a preference potentially on either the 26th or the 29th for a retreat. And then I don't know if Brent had anything else. Uh, do you have any updates on the crane and the parking structure walls? If you haven't been over there lately, Hopefully by Pretty the end amazing. of the next week, it will be complete and that crane will be out. And the crane will be gone, so. which is Actually, amazing. I thought quickly that's coming out. I thought it would take a lot longer than that. Do we know if they have the restaurant tenant secured yet? Or the I haven't heard. Tenant for Thompson Road? Yeah, I haven't heard. They're planning to start leasing April 1st. Oh, okay. Yeah. April 1st? Going much quicker than fall. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once they get the garage up, putting in the sprinkler systems and the lights, etc., sheet rocking pretty much the entire building's done now. So the finishing is carpeting, cabinetry, things mm -hmm. like that. Are we going to get a tour? Mm -hmm. Arrange for <laughs> Sure, Terry Steele would be happy to show it to you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? And that concludes our finance and administration community at 817.